Good afternoon. Uh, this is Professor Jones. Uh, we're going to be talking today about peripheral arterial disease. Your learning objectives for this course are to talk about risk factors for peripheral arterial disease, what the patho is, what it looks like, um, what the collaborative care and nursing management of peripheral arterial disease is. Um, and we're going to talk about nursing interventions and nursing management for patients with peripheral arterial disease. So to start with, review of anatomy. Your arterial system consists of high pressure, thick walled vessels that carry oxygenated blood to all the tissues from the left ventricle of the heart. Um, the aorta, let me see if I can... So as you can see on this diagram, the aorta rises upwards a short distance and then curves to form the aortic arch, which supplies the subclavian and the carotid arteries, which therefore oxygenate your brain and your arms. And then it goes downward to form the descending aorta, which splits off into two portions. Um, first portion is the thoracic aorta and then the second portion is the abdominal aorta and then it separates into two common iliac arteries which go down the legs and eventually form the femoral arteries. Um, the aorta is the largest artery in the body and more prone to aneurysm formation. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, it is also susceptible to enhanced stiffness and arthrosclerotic plaque. Peripheral arterial disease involves progressive narrowing and degeneration of the arteries of the upper and the lower extremities. And arthrosclerosis, fatty deposits of plaque, is the leading cause in the majority of cases. Common sites of these arthrosclerotic lesions or plaque buildup include the abdominal aorta in the belly, um, the iliac arteries, the femoral arteries, the popliteal arteries behind the knees, and the tibial arteries and peroneal arteries in the foot. Um, these are areas where arthrosclerotic plaque can build up and cause problems with circulation. Peripheral arterial disease typically appears in ages 60 to 80. It goes largely undiagnosed because patients that have peripheral arterial disease can have issues with other parts of their body before the periphery becomes affected. Another thing to remember about your patients with peripheral arterial disease is that if they have arthrosclerosis in their peripheral arteries, they're also going to have arthrosclerosis in their heart, in their head, so they're going to be at risk not only for complications from PAD, but also they're probably going to have coronary artery disease, they're going to have arthrosclerosis in their carotids, they're going to be at risk for stroke. These are not well patients, so just keep that in mind. Um, risk factors for PAD include cigarette smoking, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. These are two specific phenomenons associated with peripheral arterial disease that I want you to know for your examination. Please take some time to look at them. Berger's disease is a disorder of the small and medium-sized arteries of the upper and lower extremities. Typically, it affects men ages under 45 years old who have smoking history and also periodontal disease. The treatment for Berger's disease is always to quit smoking and it's very important if you have these patients that you educate them about this. They um, have such bad disease in their fingers that sometimes they end up losing them. Um, and Raynaud's phenomenon, this is very common in women, uh, usually ages 15 to 40, where they have vasospasm in their hands. Um, I have a beautiful picture of this. One of my friends has Raynaud's, and whenever she goes skiing, her fingers literally um, look like they are red, white, and blue because the demarcation of the vasospasm is pretty severe. I'll see if I can post that in the lecture as well. So peripheral arterial disease can affect all the different arteries that we looked at before in that, that big picture about your um, arteries. And usually it's where arteries come together or where there is like a large area, like in the aortic um, 
artery. Uh, you can see in the picture there, the arthrosclerotic plaque kind of forms in the area in the middle of the artery, narrowing it and making delivery of arterial blood difficult. For our case study, we're going to talk about B.D. He is a 62-year-old guy. He is complaining of pain in his lower legs when he's walking his dog. The pain is relieved with rest. He does have a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, and he is a smoker, smokes one pack of cigarettes a day. The classic symptom of peripheral arterial disease is intermittent claudication. You must know this for your exam. Please know that intermittent claudication is muscle pain that's caused by a constant level of exercise. It usually resolves with rest after about 10 minutes or so, and it's reproducible. So Mr. BD goes on a walk with his dog. He walks maybe half a mile down the road to the yellow house and his legs bother him and he has to rest there for 10 minutes then he can get up and continue walking his dog to the blue house maybe the next day you know he goes to walk his dog and before he gets to the yellow house his legs start hurting him and he knows this is intermittent claudication it's relieved by rest and whenever he goes for a walk longer than that however it long it takes to get to the yellow house he's going to have this pain. Paresthesia is another symptom of peripheral arterial disease. It's numbing or tingling in the toes and feet. Um, it produces loss of pressure and deep pain sensation. And this is problematic because injuries that occur can go unnoticed by the patient. Obviously, we have sensation, we have pain for a reason. Um, and if you have no feeling in your toes or in the first half of your feet, it would be easy to have an injury and not know it. Um, oftentimes, patients with peripheral arterial disease who have paresthesia um, will have injuries kind of where the ball of the foot is caused by pressure because they don't know that they're causing pressure injuries at the bottom of their feet because they can't feel it. Other clinical manifestations of PAD, thin, shiny, and taut skin, loss of hair or sparse hair on the lower legs, diminished or absent pedal, popliteal, or femoral pulses. Um, also, there are these things called pallor of foot with leg elevations. So if I'm sitting up, if I'm like lying back in bed and I put my legs up in bed, my feet get pale because I have lost gravity helping my blood flowing to the end of my feet. And conversely, if I put those feet down on the floor and sit up on the side of the bed, my feet become red. That's called reactive hyperemia of the foot. The foot becomes red when it's held in a dependent position. That's because gravity is assisting in uh, putting the blood flow down into that foot. Other manifestations, pain at rest that occur in the foot or toes. Again, it's aggravated by elevating the limbs because you're working against gravity to have that arterial flow get to the foot. Um, the pain is caused by insufficient blood flow and it does occur more often at night. Usually at night when patients are lying in bed, they may have a lower blood pressure. It may be more difficult for those feet to be perfused with arterial disease. So for assessment findings, when you're assessing Mr. BD, you find that his feet are pale and they're cool to the touch, not great arterial circulation. He has diminished pedal and posterior tibial pulses and he has decreased sensation. He says he can't really feel you that well when you're touching his feet. He does have a small open area that's on the lateral side of his left ankle. Now, when we talk about wounds in peripheral arterial disease, I want you to think about a plant that's sitting in a pot on your windowsill. When you don't remember to water your plant because you have a million other things to do, what happens to that plant? It dries up like it doesn't get the um, nutrients that it needs because it doesn't get enough water and it kind of atrophies and it shrivels up. That's the type of wound that you see with peripheral arterial disease. 
it's a disorder of the blood flow towards your limbs. So you're gonna see delayed healing. These wounds can become infected. You can get tissue necro necrosis, also known as dry gangrene, and you can get arterial ulcers, which have a very typical punched out appearance like this wound that we see here. Complications. They, uh, wounds definitely become worse, as you can see with these toes here, that's dry gangrene. Um, these non-healing arterial ulcers and gangrene are the most serious complication of peripheral arterial disease. Um, it can result in amputation. And, um, you know, I worked with a vascular surgery team when I did my clinical for my nurse practitioner education. And one of the things that we saw most often were patients who had these terrible non-healing wounds, but who really wanted to save their feet. They didn't want amputation. It was always something that was viewed as a last resort. So when you're talking to patients who have arterial disease, you know, remind them how important it is to inspect their feet daily and to have meticulous foot care to to prevent any of these complications. Diagnostic studies that are done for patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease include Doppler ultrasound, um, the ankle brachial index, which is something you can do in, well, if we were in clinical, you could do this using a handheld Doppler um, and taking the patient's brachial blood pressure and then taking a blood pressure around the ankle and comparing the two. Um, please review ankle brachial index. There's a procedure in your textbook. Review that and make sure that you understand it and see how it can tell if your patients have arterial disease. Um, angiography and MRA are both studies that are done in the radiology department. Um, angiography is actually where they um, go in with dye and look at particular blood vessels and see how the blood flow is in those vessels. Um, one of the difficulties with the angiography when it's done using a CAT scan is that the dye is definitely hard on patients' kidneys and a lot of your patients with PAD have pre-existing kidney disease, diabetes, and hypertension. So they're not the healthiest group to begin with. So this um, this test always has to be um, done by a doctor who's sensitive to the needs of your patients with renal disease. And then uh, they can also do uh, different Doppler studies to find out how the blood flow is in the different vessels. Well, here we go. This is the procedure for doing an ABI. Um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, so you measure the uh, systolic pressure in the brachial artery of the arm and you can hear through the Doppler what that blood flow sounds like so you get a very accurate systolic blood pressure and then you do the same thing on the ankle. You record the systolic blood flow and and then here's a YouTube video. You can watch it on your own talking about Doppler pulse assessment. Um, hopefully some of you in clinical were able to use the Doppler before we ended up uh, converting to simulated clinical. But if you haven't, this video is a nice example. It's just a way to auscultate the pulse if you can't palpate it. So Mr. BD goes for angiography and unfortunately he has nearly completely obstructed vessels in his lower extremities and he's diagnosed with peripheral artery disease. So you as the nurse are gonna help him cope with this and what kind of treatment plans do you think he will have? So first of all, you're gonna tell him to quit smoking because that tar buildup, that nicotine is a potent vasoconstrictor and that's bad for him with any sort of vascular disease. Um, if he has hyperlipidemia and he's not on a statin, he's gonna buy himself a statin to better control that. Um, if he has high blood pressure, they're gonna try and aggressively control his high blood pressure so that he doesn't have worsening um, hardening of the arteries is like the old-fashioned name for arthrosclerosis. And if he's a diabetic, you're going to work on aggressively controlling his blood pressure. These are all medical treatments that can be instituted at any point for a patient with peripheral arterial disease. 
Drugs that are typically used are ACE inhibitors. Um, they can increase the patient's uh, ankle brachial index. They decrease the mortality from cardiovascular causes. They increase peripheral blood flow and they can increase a patient's walking distance. And ramipril is one that is particularly used for PAD. Doctor may also prescribe antiplatelet agents for these patients because they also have the atherosclerotic disease that's narrowing their vessels. They want to make sure that they reduce the risk of blockage as much as possible. And sometimes your patients will be put on both aspirin and Plavix. That's called dual antiplatelet therapy because the Plavix, you know, definitely makes those platelets slippery so they don't stick together as you can see in this little cartoon and aspirin uh, deactivates the platelets as well so that they don't stick together so the two agents may be prescribed together. For intermittent claudication, there are a few drugs that can be prescribed for treatment of this. Um, Pletal, which is also a platelet um, inhibitor, and it increases vasodilation to kind of help the um, vessels have a better arterial flow. Um, and then Trental increases the flexibility of the red blood cells themselves and decreases blood viscosity. So Mr. BD gets ordered aspirin, synthostatin, ramipril, and trental for his PAD. And there you see him going to walk his dog. Exercise is super important for your patients with peripheral artery disease. The tough part is to educate them to continue to walk even though they will have pain and to encourage them to just rest when they can and continue walking. So even if Mr. BD walks down to the yellow house, takes a 10 minute rest and then continues to the blue house and comes home, that's so much better for him than not doing any exercise. The goal for these patients should be 30 to 60 minutes a day, three times a week. I just like this picture. So for nutritional therapy, you want to encourage these patients to eat a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and low in cholesterol, saturated fat, and salt. You want to encourage a BMI less than 25 and a waist circumference under 40 inches for men and 35 inches for women. So if Mr. BD's um, peripheral arterial disease gets worse, there are certain things that can be done to help him with his disease. He can have revascularization, and we'll talk about that in a few slides to come. You want to protect the limb from trauma, especially if he's got um, difficulty feeling in his feet or his toes. You want to encourage him to wear good shoes, to make sure he inspects his feet daily and keeps them from becoming injured. Um, if he has pain at rest, you want to do all that you can to decrease that. You want to make sure he doesn't get infected in those feet and have some sort of wound develop or a complication of a wound. And you want to improve his arterial perfusion with either medications or you can, you know, definitely encourage him to keep exercising as tolerated. Um, these other strategies, spinal cord stimulation and angiogenesis, those are advanced techniques that we're not really going to talk about. So your case study guy, Mr. BD, comes back for his follow-up in three months. His blood pressure and lipid levels are good, but he still complains of his leg pain getting worse at rest. And the physician says it's probably time to consider some sort of advanced intervention to improve his circulation. So there are procedures that are done in interventional radiology for patients with peripheral arterial disease. If your patient has increased rest pain, increased intermittent claudication that prevents them from exercising or prevents them from doing activities of daily living, or ulceration or gangrene severe enough to threaten viability of the limb, then the patient may be a candidate for a revascularization procedure. And you can see in this picture here, that's a little metal stent that can be used. 
So a couple of these procedures are percutaneous transluminal balloon angioplasty. Um, you guys may have heard of this if you have anyone in your family who has had a heart attack. Um, they put a catheter in through the femoral artery towards the heart in the case of a heart attack, but in the case of peripheral arterial disease, they're going to put a catheter in the femoral artery and advance it to wherever the arthrosclerotic vessel is and then a balloon becomes inflated and compresses the plaque against the sides of the vessel. And this can be done with or without a stent placement. And the stent can be placed just to give a scaffolding for that um, arthrosclerotic plaque. There's a nice little picture here of a balloon. Sorry. I scooted by that picture of the balloon angioplasty. Um, here's a picture of an arthrectomy where the obstructive plaque is actually removed using a little cutting disc or a laser and suctioned out. And then this is a picture of cryoplasty, which combines the um, angioplasty with a balloon there and cold therapy. Liquid nitrous oxide is put inside the balloon to um, kind of freeze the plaque up against the side of the vessel. For surgical therapies, a peripheral artery bypass surgery is something that's done. The patient's um, own vein can be used. Now remember, a vein is a low pressure, thin walled vessel and artery is a thick walled, high pressure vessel. So people can have venous grafts put in, um, but sometimes a synthetic graft is used to bypass blood around an obstructing lesion. Um, and percutaneous transluminal angioplasty with stenting can be used in combination with bypass surgery. Depending on how bad a person's peripheral vascular disease is, they may use more than one approach. These are some good pictures of what a bypass graft might actually look like. Um, so on the in picture A, you can see the patient's femoral artery is uh, clogged up with arthrosclerotic plaque, and they put a bypass in uh, using a vein from the above the area of obstruction to the popliteal artery, and that will help the blood to flow around that obstructed area. Um, the second picture, uh, B, is a patient with worse disease. It goes all the way through the femoral artery to the popliteal and the um, anterior tib or posterior tib actually is occluded. And that um, graft there is a synthetic graft. They put a little stripe on it so that you can see it's synthetic. And it goes all the way up from above that femoral artery down to the posterior tibial artery. Um, so this patient has pretty significant disease and they're using that bypass graft to make sure that the foot stays well perfused in that case. Uh, surgical therapy can be a combination of endarterectomy, patch graft, angioplasty, amputation, and or limb salvage. You can see this foot here probably had some pretty bad arterial wounds on it and possibly what was done is some sort of uh, graft was placed to improve the flow to the foot itself as well as it looks like there was some skin grafting done over the top of the foot um, maybe because there was a non-healing wound there. Um, things to remember when you're talking about arterial wounds um, is that the patients are going to need good flow to the foot to help heal any wounds that are there. You can do you know, whatever wound care you want, but if the patient doesn't have good blood flow to the foot, it's really a waste of time. You need to make sure that they have good perfusion if you want those wounds to heal. So when you do your nursing history on these patients, you wanna assess them for their past health history. Are they a smoker? Do they have high blood pressure? Are they overweight? Do they have hyperlipidemia? Um, are they diabetics? How well are their blood sugars controlled? Um, I can tell you that when I worked with vascular surgery, all of our patients, pretty much all of our patients, had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes, and a good percentage of them were smokers. Um, your blood vessels do not like 
sa high saturated fat diet, uncontrolled blood sugar, hypertension, and nicotine. It's just a terrible combination for blood pressure, I mean, for blood vessels themselves. Um, and so much of our health really depends upon the healthiness of our blood vessels. Um, when we talk about peripheral arterial disease, it's the life blood getting to our tissues. That's how we stay healthy. So, um, you know, encourage your patients, whatever lifestyle changes they can make, even if it's a small start, you know, no takeout once a week, whatever it is, encourage them to make those healthy lifestyle changes. For assessment, you'll see these patients have uh, loss of hair on the legs and feet. They have difficulty exercising because of their intermittent claudication, and you may have a really hard time feeling their peripheral pulses. Um, for anatomic landmarks, when you're dealing with pulses, for the, um, for the, um, Oh my gosh, dorsalis pedis pulse. Usually I start at the division of the first and second toe and kind of make my way back over the top of the foot with my finger. Um, usually about two inches back between that first and second toe, you'll run into the um, DP somewhere along the top of the foot. Um, if you have to go back to where the ankle is, you might be able to palpate a person's AT, anterior tibialis, which is usually right at the place where the um, ankle and the foot meet. And then the posterior tib, I usually um, go to the inside of the patient's foot and just cup my fingers right behind the malleolus. Usually it runs right up the back, the back of the ankle bone on the inside. Um, and those are good anatomic landmarks to start with if you're having trouble feeling your pulses. So Mr. BD has a bilateral percutaneous transluminal angioplasty with stenting. Um, and you're gonna think of some good nursing diagnoses for him. And what will your goals be for him postoperatively? And these are some great nursing diagnoses. You wanna make sure that he has um, better tissue perfusion at peripheral there in parentheses because they have, he has peripheral arterial disease. Um, you're gonna make sure that his skin stays in one piece, that he doesn't get wounds because of his PAD. Um, you're gonna try and improve his activity intolerance by teaching him to rest when he gets his intermittent claudication and to continue exercising to um, his, the best of his ability. And you're also gonna talk about you know, self-health management, quitting smoking, maintaining healthy blood pressure, healthy blood glucose levels, and taking all his medications as prescribed. Overall goals for these patients include adequate tissue perfusion, relief of pain. This vascular disease can cause some extremely severe pain. It was not uncommon to have patients with many, many milligrams of dilaudid for pain relief because it just really hurts a lot. Um, you wanna try and increase their exercise tolerance and maintain healthy, intact skin on their, on their extremities. For health promotion, you're gonna try and identify your at-risk patients. Any patient that is obese, any patient that has a high-fat diet or hyperlipidemia as one of their diagnoses, that patients with diabetes, um, it's so important to help them modify their diet to improve their, um, improve their risk for peripheral arterial disease. Also, you're gonna to wanna to teach proper foot care and how to avoid injuries. So Mr. BD comes to the recovery area after his PTA was stenting. He has bilateral dressings on his groins and he is positioned supine, so he is completely flat. Post-operatively, these patients will need to be monitored frequently, um, usually for patients that we care for with uh, any sort of intervention through the groin. It's a Q15 minute check for the first hour and Q30 minute checks for the next hour and Q1 hour checks for the first four hours because these are arterial access sites and the patients can bleed out very quickly. Um, you want to make sure you assess the skin color, temperature, the capillary refill, 
the presence of peripheral pulses distal to the operative site, and what's their sensation and their movement of the extremity like. So make sure that you are very cognizant of these patients after intervention, that they are positioned flat, that their groin sites are intact. If you, um, so if you are taking care of one of these patients and they lose the pulse, that's going to be, um, you know, that's going to be a phone call. You want to make sure that you are assessing their circulatory system continually and you're monitoring for potential complications. Uh, these patients can have, uh, you know, reocclusion of an area if the stent fails. They can have uh, problems with their groin access sites up to and including bleeding out through them. Um, and that's why you're going to keep them flat and make sure that they don't, you know, flex their knees too quickly or too often. And you're going to turn them in position frequently to make sure that they don't get any sort of skin breakdown. So Mr. BD did fine postoperatively, and you're going to discharge him home. You're going to teach him about how to care for himself and what sort of precautions he's going to take at home. So what patient teaching is going to be essential for Mr. BD to manage his peripheral arterial disease? You're going to teach him to continue to manage his risk factors. He's going to have to take his antiplatelet therapy. He's going to have to increase his physical activity gradually after surgery. And most importantly, you want to talk to him about meticulous foot care. He's going to have to inspect his feet daily. Make sure that he has comfortable shoes with rounded toes and soft insoles. And make sure that he keeps his shoes lightly laced, especially your patients with um, any sort of neuropathy or paresthesias where they don't have good sensation in their feet. Even a shoe laced too tightly can cause a wound in a short amount of time. So daily inspection of the feet, make sure they have comfortable shoes and they're lightly laced. For evaluation, you want these patients to maintain good peripheral tissue perfusion. You don't want them to get any wounds. You want them to be able to maintain their activity levels, and you want to make sure that they understand why they're doing what they're doing, why it's so important for them to eat well and exercise and stay away from cigarettes. You can make plans with your patient for a walking program. You know, we're going to walk to the Blue House. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you're going to try to go past the blue house to the red house using rest periods as necessary to increase the activity tolerance of your patient. Um, make sure that they can verbalize to you why they're taking their medications, what the um, what the disease means for them, peripheral arterial disease, you know, the risk factors that they can reduce by eating well and by taking good care of their feet and make sure that they know what their treatment plan is. So one of the complications that can occur with patients who have um, arterial disease is they can have an acute arterial ischemic disorder. So this picture is pretty profound. That's kind of what you would see if your patient had an arterial occlusion or arterial ischemia. Um, it's remembered by the six P's, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, which also means like numbness and tingling, paralysis, and polar, which is you know, substitute for cold. That's a Greek word. I'm not going to try and say it. Um, but if you have a patient who is having terrible, terrible pain in an extremity and you can't get a pulse, that's a phone call. Don't wait for all six. Any of these usually signifies a big problem. And it's important to be able to communicate that to the provider caring for your patient. Um, it is a surgical emergency. You can see here this patient had, um, you know, probably had some sort of graft occlude, and so they had to have some sort of surgery done as well 
uh, to reopen that artery and to restore perfusion. This is a surgical emergency. It is uh, something that requires surgical intervention, um, can be treated with anticoagulation, but usually um, if the intervention is not done quickly, patients can lose their limb um, and they can you know, have it amputated. And I've seen um, big uh, malpractice issues with acute arterial ischemia. It's so important as the nurse caring for these patients that we communicate clearly to the provider what we're seeing. Um, it can occur due to trauma, an embolic event, uh, hypovolemia, and a hypercoagulable state. Um, but for this lecture, I'm talking about patients who come to you after having an intervention done who subsequently like reocclude their graft or have some sort of complication and end up with arterial ischemia of the limb. When you're talking to a provider, it's very important to use a structured communication format such as I SBAR Q, which is SBAR plus your introduction in the beginning and time for questions at the end, or CUS. And CUS, uh, I think we're going to have a slide about it going on, but it's like I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable, and I have a safety issue. Usually I always start with iSPARK and then go to CUS only if I don't get an appropriate response from the provider. Make sure that you've done your full assessment on your patient and you have all your data ready for the provider you're calling, especially paying attention to changes in the assessment that concern you. So this is a rundown of iSpark. Introduce yourself. I'm calling for Miss, you know, Sally patient. She had a, you know, intervention done earlier. Uh, a stent was placed for arterial occlusion in her right limb. She came to me uh, post-op without any pain and with a beautiful uh, PT and DP pulse in that right limb. And now the patient's, you know, screaming in pain. I can't get her pain under control. Her foot is blue up to the middle of the foot and I have no DP pulse and a weak PT. Those are all red flags. So surely just that small amount of information I should have a doctor letting me know where they want the patient sent either for stat imaging or if they want them sent back to the operating room you know these, this is a really um, this is a really urgent thing you want to be communicating but you also can't call up and you know not give the appropriate information in a solid format um, if the provider isn't sure what you're trying to say, it's never it's never uh, a problem to say I'm concerned the patient has acute arterial ischemia or has reoccluded their graft or whatever you're trying to say, and um, make sure that you take some time afterward. You know, do you have any questions for me, or is there anything that I can clarify for you? If you don't get an appropriate response, the provider kind of poo-poo's what you're saying and like hangs up on the phone and you have a screaming patient with an obviously ischemic limb, you're going to, you know, notify your charge nurse, notify whoever your senior nurse is on staff or on duty and try again. And you can use the CUSS format at this time. Um, I usually, you know, if I have to go this route, I usually am very clear, you know, I'm caring for this patient, Sally, whatever, and she is writhing in pain. Her vital signs are unstable. I'm very concerned. This is making me uncomfortable, and this is a safety issue. I'm worried she has arterial ischemia, and she'll lose her leg if we don't do something for her now. And usually, um, these three statements will get the attention of a provider that's not hearing your concern. And even if um, the provider says, no, 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 I know Sally, you know, she's she's not really in that much pain. I did her graft myself. It's, it's perfect. There's no chance it could be occluded. At least you as a nurse can document that in your, you know, nurse's note, notified provider, you know, concern, safety issue, big change in patient condition, and should something happen, you have really protected yourself by taking this extra step. Um, you know, hopefully you'll never have to do that, but just in case, I always like to keep this communication tool in my back pocket in case I need it.